Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, friends. I'm so pleased to be here and so pleased to have this opportunity to expound on my favorite subject, the monetization of silver. I want to tell you that I've always had, an, since I was a child, I've had an interest in, in, monetary, in monetary matters, especially gold. When I was about 10 years old, my father won a lottery, had a lottery ticket that won a small prize. Well, it wasn't such a small prize. It was 100 pesos. And he said, well, I'll give you the 100 pesos. On. What, what would you like to have? What would you like to do with 100 pesos? I said, buy me some gold coins. That's what I want. So each one of those gold coins was worth 10 pesos. So I got 10 little gold coins. They were two peso coins, the smallest denomination in Mexico. Tiny little coins about the size of your small fingernail. It said two pesos on them. They had, now I know, so they had one and a half grams of pure gold in each one, and I got 10 of them, and that was my first acquisition of gold, and I hoarded those until I was, until uh, uh, my wife Esther and I were married, I still had those coins, so that just proves that the velocity of circulation of gold is zero, as Antal <laughs> would say. <laughs> uh, well, when we had a debacle the last debacle, or the most recent one, not the last one, the most recent one that we had in Mexico was in 1995. And I said, well, what the heck? This is, this is happening over and over. What, just what the heck is going on? And I got trying to get to the bottom of the thing. Well, I happen to have uh, at hand an, one article by Michael Belkin whose name should be familiar to you. And it said, well, Mexico has run into trouble again because it's been borrowing short and lending long. Ah, that rang a bell. And so I picked up from my library a little pamphlet with, a, with an excellent content and written by none other than Antal Fekete, borrowing long Borrowing short and lending long, credit illiquidity and credit collapse. That was the title of that uh, pamphlet, published by CMRE, Committee for Monetary Research and Education, headed by Elizabeth Courier. And so, reading that again, and uh, reading Michael Belkin's, and the inspiration came to me. It's silver. We've got to put silver into, we've got to make a move from paper to silver, which has been our traditional Mexican money. But we're never going to get out of this mess. And I began to slowly, other intuitions began to come in. I don't know how, I can't explain the process of intuition. How it is that all of a sudden, after thinking so many years about these problems, the, the thing just began to, the problem began to unfold before my eyes and I discovered something for myself that, that Jax Ruff had discovered many years before, but I, but I hadn't been aware of that. I discovered it for myself, really, and I feel rather satisfied that I'd, I got to that on my own. And that is that the United States is flooding the world with with paper, which is accepted as payment, but it's not really a payment because it's not a, a good, it's just a paper, but it's accepted as payment. And in return for that, the world sends the United States uh, a, a, a veritable flood of goods. And that is nothing but else but a, a kind of exaction of tribute. It's exaction of taxes on, a, on an immense scale. That can't go on. That is not going to go on. And one way to, the only way, I think, to put a stop to this distortion of the world is that we should eventually go return to a system where value for value, if 
if, you, if you're paying for one thing with a value, you must get something else in return. Also, I sus subscribe to Antal's real bills doctrine. I think it is a necessary adjunct to gold as a clearing system. But I also think that we must attempt to bring back the use of precious metals. And I do not think that we can do that by just uh, returning to the Constitution. So I just don't think it can be done. Uh, I don't know, do not think that any decree or worldwide agreement on returning to gold is feasible because it would simply kill the world's economy as it is uh, overnight. It's like a drug addict that is, that is absolutely hooked on heroin and he is suddenly withdraws or is not provided with the heroin, he'd probably like to die from it. He's probably, he may die from the shock. And that is what may happen to us. So I don't think that it's possible for, I don't really know how we're going to get out of this mess. That is a mess that is going to bring an awful lot of pain. But I think that we should do something that we can use as a palliative. We, we need a palliative. We're going to need something, and that is why the reluctance of central bankers around the world to, to think of gold or silver as money is going, to, is going to be overcome. There's going to be a change in attitude when the frightening, terrifying disaster finally strikes upon us then there is going to be a, a change of mind. And that is when I think that this idea of how to introduce money into circulation, I mean, silver and gold too, into circulation in parallel with paper will become attractive. The the, the masters of the world are the bankers at the present time, and I don't know for how long they, they will continue that way, but I think we have to recognize that they are in the catbird seat, at least for the time being. And when are we going to dethrone them? I don't know. But I think that perhaps we should think that the bankers themselves feel trapped. The central bankers feel trapped the politicians and the rulers, the, the, the civil rulers, also feel trapped. And nobody is thinking. Nobody knows exactly, well, what, what can we do? Nobody is thinking. Nobody is, is, is trying to find a way out. We're, they're just, the people who are in power are coping with a situation which they have inherited. But they're not contributing anything to a resolution, because none of them feels capable of doing something. They are earning a wage. They are looking for re-election. They don't have time to think of something that will ease this situation. This is what I'm offering. We're offering a way out that won't be a panacea, but it will be a palliative. And if those who are in power recognize that this is an attractive palliative, that the people like it, that the people have confidence in it, that it brings goodwill from the people, that it brings re-election, then they will perhaps offer more and more and more until the palliative becomes an important factor in the economy. Well, well I'll be getting now into this, into my main theory. What happened over the last 100 years? I don't, won't go back further because we don't have time. What happened over the last 100 years? The, the precious metals were pushed slowly by a series of measures and by the consequence of the previous measures and other measures that came one upon the other. What happened? That was that paper money, which was originally the auxiliary, the helper of real money, gold and silver, the servant 
grew and grew and grew and finally overmastered his master and threw him out of the house. So now the servant, paper money, completely unrelated to any uh, precious, precious metal or anything else, is now the master of the house. This project is the first attempt, to my knowledge, in 100 years, the first attempt to bring back the master into the house. Now, the master, gold and silver, he's going to come back into the house in a humble disguise. <laughs> yes? Just like paper. Came in as a humble disguise. It's easier to fold money than to carry around heavy coins. So he's coming back in a humble disguise as an auxiliary. Just a little bit, you know. It's not the whole thing we want to change, just a little bit. Then that's the way I think it's called incrementalism. Just a little slice. That's all we want. And try it. Try it. I've heard this. I've heard this in the Congress. I've heard the congressmen arguing against their, uh, the few opponents that there is in the Congress. But why don't we try this and see what happens? No. We, it's, I'll tell you about that later. But it's very interesting. So here is, we begin now with how to bring money back, r silver back into circulation. The silver coin in Mexico, why did it go out of circulation? How can we reintroduce it back into circulation? Please, Mr. Villasana, are you asleep? Oh. <laughs> Background. Mexico has been famous for its silver, for its silver coinage for centuries. Uh, since 1535 is the date of the founding of the Mexican mint. 1535. The Central Bank of Mexico has coined various silver pesos since its creation in 1925 up until the present. A constant political effort has existed to use silver in the Mexican peso up to the present time. The flaw has been that we have been engraving a nominal value on the coin. Now, you, in a, with a precious metal that has to circulate along with paper, that cannot be. Because paper is, a, is an inflationary medium that is continually raising prices. And if you engrave a value on a coin, you are making it, you're, you are condemning it to a swift uh, end. It will not be money for very much longer. Here we have first case. I would just want to give you a few illustrations. The first case here is this peso was coined from 1920 to 1945, 25 years, and this is a coin I remember from my childhood, was contained 12 grams of silver, pure silver. It weighed 16 and a two thirds grams, so it was 0.72 fine. And as you can see from the graph, it never had a, it was never circulated with its complete, on the basis of its silver value. It circulated as one peso, which that was the value it was given, the coin, by the mint, by the central bank, or by the government, whoever it was. And when it began, only half of the value of the peso was actually silver. The blue part represents the fiducia, the, the the uh, intrinsic value of the silver in the peso. And this coin lasted for 25 years. It was a beautiful coin. I, I used to treasure them, and it was very hard to spend this coin because it was very pretty, and you didn't want to look, get rid of it. Uh, at, but as you can see, what happened during the 30s, the price of silver went down, and yet the coin continued to circulate. There were 458 million of these coins were, were, were minted during the 25-year period it existed. Then the price of silver went up in the mid-30s, and again it fell. Then Second World War in 1940, uh, the 40s, the early 40s, the price was completely stable of silver. You notice no, no variation. And then after the war, the, I imagine that, that what happened was the price controls on, on the metals were lifted. And all of a sudden, and we had also a lot of 
fiat money creation in Mexico during the, the, the Second World War, we had a repressed inflation that as soon as the war was over, boom, the value of the silver in the coin went past the nominal value and the coin ceased to exist. The, uh, the, those hundreds of millions, most of those 458 million went to the smelter, the, or the refinery, and they were melted down. And so we were left without silver coinage. That the, 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 the coin reached its point of, what is called the point of fusion. Here we have two more histories. We have the history here of uh, the, the coin from 1947 to 1949. This only had, this is a Roman style of doing things, you see. Only seven grams. The previous coin had 12 grams. So they went to seven grams. And uh, you can see the same thing happened to it. The, the price of, in pesos of silver went up from 80 centavos to 100, uh, reached 100, uh, and, and uh, went over the nominal value of the peso, and so that coin had to be discontinued. And again, again, the Roman way of doing things was to reduce the silver content of the, of the coinage. Here, the next one was 1950 to 54. We had a peso 0.3 fine. It only had four grams of silver. Uh, but the same thing happened to it. We had a devaluation in 1954, and that coin had to go out of circulation. The next one, Mr. Viesen, please. Then we had, this is really, now we're getting down to sort of Diocletian times. <laughs> Peso, 0.1 fine, only 1.6 grams of silver. And that lasted 10 years. From, it had an intrinsic value of uh, about 60 centavos, and it lasted and lasted, but until we had another uh, crisis, uh, that was when silver began to go up, not, not because of our devaluation, but it began to go up because of dollar devaluation, and it went up to over $2 silver, uh, or past 129, I think, to do two dollars. And so for that reason, also the coin ceased to circulate and it was melted down. We don't have that coin anymore except the numismatics. The next we come to the monetary reform of 1979. Now we had a, a president who made a, a great deal of mistakes. Uh, poor man, really, he was hounded for the rest of his life for some serious mistakes he made, but he did have one good political intuition. He had a good political sense. He was a politician, a true politician. And he said, well, we can't have silver coins because they have a nominal value. So make a coin without a nominal value. So everybody, we had strong presidents, so everybody said, yes, sir. It will be done, it shall be done. And we had the introduction into circulation of a silver coin with no engraved nominal value, the Libertad, a fluctuating value based on its silver content, and it is still a legal tender coin. Now, it contains one ounce of pure silver. This coin has never reached the point of fusion. In other words, it, there is no price at which it's going to go out of circulation because it has no nominal value. In spite of devaluations, it still exists. It has been minted continuously since 1979, so we have 20 million or over 20 million in the hands of the Mexican people. But what the president, Lopez Portillo, wanted was for this coin to be used as money, and that he failed. He failed because the coin could not be used as money on account of its monetary value would one day be higher and one, the next day it would be lower. And this caused a, a, a tension, a conflict between buyers and sellers, between debtors and creditors. And the Banco de Mexico was in the middle of this uh, of this uh, problem because it was the institution that quoted the value for the coin. And so, the, 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 although the law is on the books, 
It's not, it's in abeyance, it can't be, it can't be observed. And the Banco de Mexico no longer quotes it, no longer gives it a value, and it cannot be used as money, but is used as a means of savings. So, this is what happened. Conclusion, we've had a constant effort to use silver coinage, which has been unceasing all through our history. The mistake in recent times of when, when the precious metals have become ban banished from the house of money is to give it an engraved value, because if we give an engraved value, as I said just a minute ago, uh, eventually the paper will make that engraved value uh, obsolete because the, the, the inflation produces the rise in the intrinsic value and it goes over the en engraved value, as I have just shown you, and goes out of circulation. The Libertad ounce, as a fluctuating legal tender, because of its fluctuating legal tender value, this blocked its use as a means of payment. So, the solution, one, correct, as President Lopez Portillo had the intuition and ordered, the coin will have a quoted nominal value, yes, not an engraved value, yes. It will never reach the point of fusion, yes. And there will be seigniorage for the central bank. The central bank has an interest in minting this coin. There are other systems that are preferable, that are more civilized, I would even say. A system as there was in England, where the, it was considered that it was an obligation of the state to provide the best money possible for its people. And it's an, a highly enlightened attitude. So that it declared free coinage, that all for it. But I see that we are scarcely able to, to think of that when this is such a problem, to think of free coinage is, is very much more difficult for me. I, I just want to find the easiest way to bring the precious metals humbly back into the house. We'll do anything the masters want, just let us come into the house as money, sire. And then perhaps, in that way, once we get our foot in the door, that will be a different matter. First, we must have the monetization of silver or gold or both. And to, for that, we must make it as easy as possible politically. So we give the central bank a seniorage. They can, I'm suggesting, I've been suggesting a method of quoting, but that is not written in stone. They, there can be different ways of quoting of a monetary value. The next, please, Licenciado. The, the official quote from the central bank, this quote will be its legal tender value in Mexican pesos. Both the quoted and engraved nominal values fulfill the same function, to communicate the value. Why do we have a coin that says, uh, uh, one quarter, or 10 cents, or a dime, or five cents. Well, it's to tell the people what it's worth, what, it, what its value is. When there was a dollar, it was a dollar, it said one dollar. That's the value of the coin. So it has a, an engraved value so that people know, know, can know. It's a communications thing. It has to do with information technology. But there are other ways of communicating a value. It doesn't have to be engraved. It's not an essential part of the coin. What is essential is, this, is the precious metal content, not the engraving on it. So the quoted value can be made public by press, radio, television, the interbank net, or the internet. So there are many means of communication instantly to, for, so that people can know what is the latest quote. I'll hear as an aside, I will say 
that the, the legal tender quote should be a number that can be easily remembered and should end in zero or in five. We wouldn't want a, a coin, uh, a, a silver ounce, that would, uh, would cost 114 pesos and 73 cents. I mean, who's going to remember that? It's too difficult. But if we say 115 pesos, that's easily remembered. The next stop is 120. The next stop is 125. That's the way I think the, the, the money should be given a quote in numbers that can be easily recalled. Third point, and this is what is hard for, going to be hard for you to wrap your minds around this coin, this, this point, is that the legal tender value once quoted must not be reduced. The value of the Libertad ounce must increase when the price of silver in pesos goes up, but it must retain its last quoted silver legal tender value in case of a fall in the peso price of silver. This is very, very important to understand. This, is, this quote is what makes the difference, what turns this coin from a commodity coin that is going up and down in the market with, its, with the price of the, of the, of the metal that's a commodity coin. This quote, and this quote that does not fall once it's, it's been stipulated, the, quote, the next quote cannot be less, this is what turns the coin into money. This is the secret. This is what I discovered. This is my contribution. This is a, a, something new. In 100 years, there's been nothing new in money except downhill. This is going uphill. We're going from worse to better. This is the key to monetizing the precious metals, a quote that does not diminish. And if you think about it, well, I thought about this. It took me eight years to get to this. I don't know. I must be dumb, but it took me eight years. I hope it doesn't take you more than five minutes. Uh, this is, the, this is the, the key to the whole thing, because you see, if, what is the first thing the mint does today if they have minted a batch of coins and it's money? Well, they send them to the bank, so the bank can hand them out, can pass them through the teller's windows to the, to the public. Now, the bank will not accept as money a remittance of coin whose value may fall the very next day. They're going to say, hey, Mr. Central Bank, I can't accept this remittance because you're, you, you, you're, you're, you're putting me at risk. It, what if the price of silver goes down and you reduce the quote? You're, you're passing on a loss to me. No, 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 please. I'm sending them right back to you. I cannot accept that as money. Send me paper. Don't send me silver because the paper bill always says, what it is, and it's not going to go down. But if you send me a coin that is supposed to be worth 115 pesos, and tomorrow is worth 110, I'm taking five peso loss on each one of those coins. I don't want those coins. Forget it. That can't be money. It stops right at the bank, let alone the people. The bank won't take them. See? So that's the reason why the quote must not go down. Nobody wants to. You can't consider as money something whose value is going to go down. The coin cannot go down because then it has an engraved value. Well, this value is not engraved, but it must also not go down. Next. Here is an example of what would have happened with the Libertad ounce in the last 10 years if it had been quoted according to our method. As you can see, we would have started out around 60 pesos, uh, per coin, it's a beautiful, you know it, well, all, an ounce is an ounce uh, anywhere, so you know that it's a, a look, what it looks like and feels like. It would have gone up to 70, 75, 85, and notice horizontal line doesn't go down. Here we have reductions in the price of silver, but the value of the coin does not go down. Then we have, a, we have spike in silver, it went up, remember? When was that? Sometime in 200, last year? 
90, 95, 100, 105, 110, 150, 120. And then the price fell. What happened? Nothing. We're down to about 60% intrinsic value, and now it's rising again, and we're up to perhaps 70% uh, intrinsic value. And the price of the peso uh, of the Libertad at present would be 120 pesos. So you can see, and again, a horizontal line until, until the price of silver rises and forces a new, quote, a new and higher quote. So that's the plan. Now, then, as a comparison, would you give me the comparison, please? Here. Here's, a, here's what happened with the 25 years of the 0720, the, the 0.72 uh, fi fine peso of 1920-1945. Horizontal line, no reduction in the quote, even if the price came down to, almost, to something like 25 cents. Uh, 25 US cents per ounce, uh, but uh, down here about 1930. That did not affect the money. It was certain, perfectly acceptable to the public, perfectly as acceptable. And this is what the Libertad ounce would look like, as you, I've just shown you. It must also, they must both share a, a horizontal line. That is the quote. It cannot go down. Otherwise, it ceases to be money. If, if, you, if the central bank maintains the quote that this, this coin with no engraved value will circulate in parallel with paper as long, indefinitely, because as we have more inflation and more creation of fiduciary, or not even fiduciary, just fiat, then the price will simply go up and up and up, and it will serve the coin will serve as an excellent means of savings for the mass of the people who will want that coin, principally a savings, but it's not a speculative operation. You see, if you and you buy, when, when we pro we're talking about gold and silver, we are, we are urging people to get into a speculative situation, really. And most people say, well, what do they tell you? Well, but the gold and the gold goes up and down. It doesn't really go up very much, and then it goes down. And, and, and of course, the, the, uh, the, those who are opposed to gold and silver exaggerate that. And so we're, we're not, we not really have been our camp. We've not really been uh, offering people money. We say gold is money, yes, but for the little people who are the mass of the consumers, gold is not money because it goes down. And if they put their few little earnings in it, it goes down 10 bucks, it's a disaster for them because they don't have much savings anyway. But if the coin is money, then the thing changes completely because everyone will want a money coin. A coin that is money, that can be used as money. It's not a speculation anymore. I have, I have money. I can use my silver at the instant I need it. If I have an accident or my son has an accident, I can take my stash of silver and go to the hospital and pay for the bill with silver. I don't have to go and sell the silver to get some money and then uh, uh, pay for, for this emergency. I can do it directly. This makes silver saving silver coins a hundred times more attractive, a hundred times more attractive, because you're not speculating, you're, you're putting a stash of money away, which is different from speculating and putting a stash of silver or of gold away. So, some notes on this program. The Mexican monetary unit will remain the fiat peso. The Libertad, when monetized, will acquire a quoted legal tender value in Mexican peso. When the Libertad is deposited in a bank for credit to an account, the credit will be in Mexican pesos at the quoted legal tender value. There will be no separate bank accounts for Libertad coins. The Mexican Central Bank will mint such quantities of Libertad as it deems convenient. 
those who wish to acquire Libertad coins may or may not find them available at their bank. Yes. We have to be very humble. <laughs> yes? Uh, that's what, that is the plan. We are, we are very humble. Now, I want to give you a surprise. I want to show you how this plan can be extended and the technique, our technique will also function for the reintroduction into European circulation of a gold coin. Here we're getting aggressive. We're not just, we're not complaining about manipulation, we're invading the opponent's territory, so to speak. This is a sort of a skirmish operation. No engraved nominal value for this coin. A quoted nominal legal tender value in euros, which can float upwards. No quote below the last quote in case of a fall in the value of gold in euros. Utilizing this technique, the gold coin would circulate permanently in parallel with the euro. This is a, a suggestion. The gold, the name is a suggestion. The gold EQ. The name is, is a completely just a, a suggestion. We suggest the gold coin to be called the EQ with the same characteristics as the French, Italian, Swiss, and Belgian coins issued under, do you hear me? Yes. Am I, am I speaking loud enough? We need the microphone. Okay.
the, the AQ, the AQ would circulate permanently in parallel with euros. Because if the price of gold went up, it too would go up. It would contribute to social and political cohesion among the nations of the European Union. Its efficiency as a symbol of European Union is unsurpassable. The message transmitted by the coin, there's always a message that goes with it. Money sends a message. Europe faces the future confidently, proudly recognizing its historic achievements and values for the benefit of mankind. The gold signifies the humane dimension of the European Union. Some thoughts. The gold ecu could be placed in circulation by using superfluous reserves to purchase gold. Maybe not all of them, but some of them. As the strongest buyer, the emu could raise the, raise the price of gold gradually. The gold EQ would provide an excellent means of savings and investments for Europeans. We know that pension plans and savings plans all over the world are not going to pay out, and Europeans are well aware of that, I'm sure. So this is the way that they can begin to provide for their future. And, uh, inflation-proof means of providing for the future. The gold AQ would give the European Central Bank a means of regulating the money supply as gold purchases by the public would absorb euros in circulation. Now, le let us say that there is a flux of excess dollars coming in. What if the part of those dollars were uh, used to purchase gold and the gold not remain in the treasury, sold to the public, and the additional money supply, when the central bank buys, buys dollars for euros from the exporters, it has more reserves, but it's putting more euros into circulation. How to stop that? How to stop the inflationary effect? Well, they do that by complicated means, which they call sterilization. But I think it has some bad effects on the interest rate. By means of putting the gold coin into circulation, offering it to the public, they would not need to raise interest rates. The public would snap up those coins, and they would return those new, newly, that newly put quantity of euros in circulation would come back to the bank, thus maintaining a stable situation. And I want to point out that this is precisely what Richard Lehman, in his article on July 27th in For on Forbes.com, has recommended for China, a really extraordinary article of his, which I recommend to you. Now, I will come back now to what's going on in Mexico. The silver bill in the Mexican Congress. We started with this in March 2003. Last April 7, we seven congressmen drew up a new bill a new bill, not the old one. We had one old one that was defeated, but they introduced a new bill. At present, this bill is being discussed in committee. Now, there's a big struggle because we have many people in favor. And there is really a passionate discussion going. Here are some of our supporters. Uh, uh, Congressman Guzman, uh, Senator Fernandez de Ceballos has mentioned that he likes the idea of silver. But he's not, I want to be truthful with you, he's not exactly one of our main supporters, but he hasn't said that he sympathizes with the idea. Then we have another congressman from another party and another congresswoman from another party. They're all very much in favor, different parties. And you must understand that in Mexico, the different parties are at each other's throats, and nothing is getting done because they're all fighting on everything, but not on silver. On Silver Day, we have a consensus in favor. Here is another, another one of our main, main supporters, Jose Julio Gonzalez Garza. He knows as much and understands as much about the importance of precious metals as almost anybody here. It's too bad he wasn't able to come. Leonardo Alvarez Romo, he's from the Green Party, also with us. And uh, this state of Zacatecas, Mining the state, of course, is with us. From a PRD, different parties. 
And this is another senator who is also in, in favor of silver. Here are the signs of the symbols of the different parties. Uh, and we had 343 congressmen sign up in favor of a silver, of silver. And there's 500 congressmen. So we're, we've got a clear majority who want silver. Silver is part of the Mexican ethos. It's part of our way of, of thinking about Mexico. Mexico is a country of silver. We all think of that. We know that. <clears throat> How can we be against it? The governors of the states of the Mexican Republic sent a communique to the representatives, House of Representatives of Congress, in which they expressed the unanimous, unanimous approval and urged the House to pass that bill at once. So the governors are in favor. Then we have here 176 Mexican newspaper writers, the main writers and the dailies, put their signatures to full page declarations which were published in the main papers of Mexico City, fully in support of silver. And finally, uh, TV Azteca has made a poll of replies from the viewers, what do they feel about, what do they think and feel about silver, and 96% of them were in favor of silver, 96%. So, here we have it. A persistent national effort may become a reality. We've started with the 1920 and, and seen why, why the peso went out of circulation because it reached a point of fusion. For, same for, with the one from, from, from 1946 to 67, a series of silver pesos all went out of circulation for the same reason. Then we had the creation of the Libertad ounce, but could not be used as a means of payment. Then we have the Morelos 100 peso coin went out of circulation. During President Salinas de Gortari, uh, his, uh, his presidency from 88 to 94, he put into circulation 10, 20, and 50 peso coins with silver, but they also went out of circulation. And most recently, the governor, Guillermo Ortiz, has put into circulation a coin with a nominal engraved value of 100 pesos, contains a half an ounce of silver, and it will go out of circulation when a half an ounce of silver is worth more than 100 pesos. I mean, that's absolutely inevitable. 2005, the silver ounce, no nominal in engraved value quoted by the Banco de Mexico would remain in circulation indefinitely because its value would go up and it would be accepted as money because the quote does not go down. And amen, that is the substance of the plan for silver which for, for which I am praying for success. But I want to tell you just as the last words, my final conclusion. Even if we do not achieve the monetization due to the opposition of the central bank, the plan is there. It's like the plan of a building or a plan for a machine. It will remain. Someday, some governor, some enlightened government is going to say, we have to do something to calm the people. We have to do something to please the people. Let us put into circulation, in parallel with paper, a precious metal coin. And this will be used. This plan will be used. I re reflect that 200 years before Christ, the Greeks in Alexandria were using steam power to move, the, the, I think, the doors uh, or, the sta or a statue in a temple. Well, uh, 2,000 years later, it was the first practical application of steam by James Watt, the Scotsman, incidentally, to pump water out of mines. So how's that? Uh, uh, the idea was there, but nobody took advantage of it. This may happen to this idea. All depends. Uh, at least there is a plan before there was no plan. There was not seen how it could be done. Now it, can, it is seen how it can be done. The question is, who wants to do it? And I thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have, I have some.
some, some a little uh, pamphlets for you. I brought 500 of these. Please help yourself. Uh, we'd rather not take them back because it's just <laughs> extra luggage. And we have these, which is my guide for this conference. Also, there's one for each one of you. Please help yourself if you like. Take it with you. Take it with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mexico, like uh, South Africa, is a rich country that is insisting on being poor.